Biology is almost alien technology. Like we compute, we walk around, we self-replicate. Like it just does these amazing things that we can't do in any form of other engineering. I think of Octane as an orthogonal bet into the world. Octane's the next generation drug discovery company. We're going after very important diseases that have not been solved to date. Uh, we're not in RV, but this is what breaking good looks like. Uh. <laughs> What's up with all the uh, cephalopods, octopuses, and... That started pretty early in the company. It's called Octant. The Octant was this tool of celestial navigation. Galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. That happens in the other direction, too. Your body is made of trillions of cells. So we're living through an age where there's been some really incredible technology breakthroughs and all of these technologies, like CRISPR, next-gen sequencing, computation, to bring those all together. They're all developed in the last 10 years. This notion that you could actually tap into and edit and program the life systems around us, debug what's happening in these like incredibly complicated cells. It was, it was just very clear to me that we were getting this new type of access to what is clearly the most powerful technology on the planet. And as humans, we were finally getting access to that technology stack. We have a chance to actually understand things that before were not understandable and build a next generation of drugs that work on those principles. If you think about like drug discovery over the many, many past decades, as it really has focused on one individual target, whether that's a specific receptor, a specific signaling pathway, kind of designing some treatment that really targets that individual target. Yeah, so the approach is about trying to engineer cellular functions. You can't simulate it. You can't AI it. You can't take it out of context. You have to study it in the cell and what's changed is our ability to input and output out of those cells. We can actually start engineering cells to leave what are essentially like digital or nucleotide breadcrumbs behind to tell us what's happening in the different stages of those pathways. That gives you these incredibly rich data maps about how you would interact with that protein using chemistry, using molecules or drugs to actually change what's happening in the cell. And then we combine that approach with our high type of chemistry approach where we're synthesizing thousands and thousands of molecules and seeing how different orientations of the molecule can target not just the individual targets that we're looking at, but a more complex version of that and, and treating not just more complex diseases, but diseases that impact a lot more patients overall. You all know that the cells in your body are all the time producing proteins. Those proteins don't get produced in their final state. They get produced sort of like an Ikea kit. And then the cell has to go about building those proteins into the right shape. The screw might be missing in the Ikea box and, and the cell has to try to figure out like, can I put this chair together anyway? And sometimes the cell can do that, sometimes it doesn't. You may not have the proteins you need to actually do the thing the protein's supposed to do. Those broken proteins start piling up in the cells and the cell keeps trying to make more of them and the cells eventually kill themselves. And so really what we're trying to do is build a drug for diseases like that. Our furthest along program is in a disease called retinitis pigmentosa. This is a progressive blinding disease, so you have rods and cones in your eye. The rod cells have this gene called rhodopsin, and if you have a mutation, if you inherit a mutation, you progressively lose your night vision, then your peripheral vision, and then your central vision. There is no treatment for that. All those patients have nowhere to go. A lot of the people who have those diseases might have slightly different mutations. How do you build a chemical that can address all of those, or at least different mutated proteins at the same time? That's a really hard problem that the way drug discovery is set up, really focused on one target at a time, is not set up to solve. We can build cell lines that express all those different mutated proteins and screen against an entire concert of these proteins instead of screening against just like one instrument in the orchestra at a time. And there's hundreds of these diseases that you could go and list like basically all the lysosomal storage diseases. Other diseases could also be in cancer where mutations lead to these kinds of misfolding and mistrafficking. This is where we do a lot of our high throughput chemistry. We're doing a screen, we find a hit, and then a big part of our platform is breaking up that chemical and making lots and lots of changes to that chemical to see what happens to the biological outputs. We use a lot of what's called synthetic biology, this ability to engineer human cells. In this part of the area is the molecular biology. Let's go build lots of plasmid, make the mutations, let's put them into human cells. And ultimately it all comes to here. What we're often doing in here is adding the chemicals to the human cells that we just engineered, and then 
then we read them out. And the way we read them out is sequencing. So this sequencing run will give us about anywhere between 400 million to a billion different reads. And those are basically counts for each one of the experiments across the thousands of conditions we're looking at. So it lets us what we call multiplex the experiment to do thousands to millions of experiments at the same time. We're generating, we're building tens of thousands of molecules day in, day out, and we need to test them against many of our engineered cell life. And part of how we do that is using really cool robots. This is Hypatia. Shall we go inside? Sure. All right, you just have to step very carefully over this. Don't step on it. That's gonna be really bad. This is shooting out different compounds. What these pucks are doing, it's gonna carry a plate in between each of these machines. What this is gonna do is shoot them into wells where each well has one of those individual engineered cell lines in it. And then we can go through it and see whether or not that compound had an impact on the cell line. I think the opportunity that really arose was this convergence of this ability to engineer human cells, this ability to read out human cells, the ability to compute on all of that. And then finally, our ability to bring in automation and robotics to, to alter chemistry. It's a lot of hard work. It takes lots of different technologies coming together, but it's an extremely powerful approach that is really native to how these technologies actually manifest in the world around us. Founding companies in tech has always been founder-driven. That's not been true in biotech. I think Sri and I are both believers in this concept of anti-disciplinary science. The most exciting things in fields happen actually at the intersections of fields. You actually need people who can do a little bit of both sides of that boundary to actually develop new things that are actually gonna impact society. The best way to understand what's happening in biology is to coax the biology to tell us, to actually get in there and be able to perturb these systems frequently enough and collect actual real empirical data to understand what's happening in these very complex pathways. I love biology. I love it so much that it, like, it just does these amazing things. It's massive construction at a scale that's global. And you can't go build a billion rocket ships. You can build a billion cells in a tiny droplet. There is a whole engineering discipline yet to be discovered around this. There's all these companies out there that are trying to like replicate biology. But at the end of the day, we're trying to replicate something that humans and organisms do just automatically. And we have no idea why. Trying to understand biology at its core, why it works, is still just a huge field that's left to be explored. Trying to build products in the world that matter to patients is really, really hard. I think ultimately, if you want to build something that patients want, you have to go and build a company. People like me, people like grad students and postdocs can go and start a company with seed funding, with this new environment of tech. It is so gratifying at the end of the day when you actually deliver that product. That's still just a ton of hard work, and that can really happen only in a company. It's been working, it's been coming together really nicely and we're really pushing towards bringing those molecules to patients as quickly as possible. Thanks for watching episode 15 of S3 and the first of five Bio Blackout episodes. Kicking it off with a company as legendary as Octant was super exciting. I think there's so many gems to take away from this episode. I think like an overall idea that I love is getting into the cell and letting the cell be the testing ground for experimentation and research development. And as Ramsey said, they kind of look at it as like, how do we perturb the system to get the results we want versus creating a fix to, to singular problems? They're looking at it from a much more holistic cellular point of view. I also love that if you look at their approach it's like first principles based. They're not just relying on bio black magic, which, you know, doesn't really exist. There's like an engineering approach to this. And you even hear Sri talking about this idea of biology being a not yet formulated discipline of engineering. That's super exciting. I've never thought of biology as an engineering discipline. And Sri sees it that way. And there's going to be hundreds of years of development in this field. And we're just getting started. I'd like to give a huge shout out and thank you to Pillar for partnering with S3 to do this bio blackout where we're featuring some of the most exciting companies in the bio startup space. I think this idea of founder-led bio and building biotech startups versus relying on the big biotech corporations to do everything is really exciting. We've seen this happen in the past decades with hard tech and deep tech companies, and now it's maybe time to see it in biotechnology too. So stick around for the next four episodes of our bio blackout. And again, thank you to Pillar for sponsoring this so that we can tell the stories of more amazing biotech startups. Thanks for watching. Keep them building the future. And I'll see you next week for episode two of our bio blackout, where we're going to look at